Good morning and welcome to Calvary. It's good to have you all here this morning worshiping with us. I uh, hope you're having a wonderful Father's Day. So uh, all you guys out there, I hope you have loved on your dad, reached out to your dad, sent him a card, done whatever you need to do to uh, to love on him. But uh, once again, first off, I just want to welcome you all to Calvary uh, on this Sunday morning. And we'll just ask you, if you are visiting with us, uh, please go to our website, springscalvary.com, and uh, let us know uh, in the connection area that you are here joining us today. Send us an email and just kind of let us know you're, you're worshiping with us today. But uh, we are excited to be offering these services with you and uh, being able to do what we do. Uh, once again, we are con- continue to be under repair here at the church. And so Calvary family, I would ask you, please uh, be in prayer over this next couple of weeks. We did not make any more progress this week. Um, there was a few things that was done, but we are still waiting on insurance. So I'm going to ask all you saints out there uh, to literally uh, live out Luke chapter 18 and be that persistent widow to go to the um, ungodly uh, judge and ask and appeal that God would just break hearts and just continue to help us kind of move forward. Um, specifically, uh, uh, Loreen and Peter, uh, who are at Brotherhood, that they would answer uh, voicemails, that they would answer emails, and they would reply to our request uh, so we can get back in the building just as soon as possible. But I would uh, just ask you guys to continue to persistently pray that uh, we would be able to move forward in the restoration project and get back into our building just as soon as possible. Uh, A couple of brief announcements for you. I do want to remind you that uh, next Sunday, uh, the 25th, we will be meeting at Bear Creek Park and having hopefully a lovely time of get-together over there. Uh, So we hope you guys can make it. Uh, Once again, uh, bring your food and whatnot and then enough to kind of share. I would encourage you to also bring your lawn chairs and things like that and maybe even your umbrella. You never know what the weather is going to be like uh, with this wonderful swampy Uh, June weather that we have. I I ask ask God to continue to do that. So, And then don't forget, on July the 2nd, we will have Elizabeth Shacklin that will be sharing with us um, just what God's been doing in her heart and life as she's our missionary overseas right now. Um, But we're just excited about that. But I'm going to ask you guys to stand up, turn around where you're at um, in your place and love on your neighbors. Hopefully you have a great crew over there at your house today, uh, watching our services, but stand up, turn around, greet one another. And of course, show the love of Calvary.
Would you pray with me, Calvary? Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much that you are God and King and that you're a ruler of all. And so, Lord God, right now, just prepare our hearts and our lives as we enter into this time of worship uh, through singing of songs or even giving of our tithes and of our offerings, um, through hearing of your message and your truth, Father God. And Lord God, above all, just rend our hearts towards the things that concern you. And Lord God, just uh, on this Father's Day, let us remember that you are our true heavenly Father. And we love you and we praise you, Jesus. But uh, be with us now. Be with Pastor Mike as he brings the word and, and Pastor Nate as he uh, leads us in a time of worship of songs. But above all, Lord Jesus, be the ruler of our heart here today. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Calvary and welcome to this live stream for Father's Day. I just want to give a shout out to all your fathers, grandfathers out there who literally have taken the world on your shoulders and have done a great job to raise kids. I know some days it just feels like there's a lot on you. There's a lot of pressure, um, but just be encouraged today that uh, you are seen, you are heard, and you're doing a great job. So, you know, as a father myself, I have a two-year-old, and that's, that's always exciting, never a dull moment. Amen. Well, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you that you are good and your mercy endures forever. And Father, I just thank you for all those who have gathered today, that you would fill their homes with your presence, uh, just taking aside all distractions as we come into your courts with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and stand. Uh, you know, we can't praise the Lord sitting down. Sing, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endure it forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you, who you are. We worship you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you, who you are. Oh, you are good. You are good. Sing, Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. We sing, people. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Oh, how. From every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you, who you are. We worship. You are. 
Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Lord, we just thank you that your grace is enough today, that you are enough, Lord. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. Sing so remember. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. For your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Sing, great is your love. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember, so remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. And yeah, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Yeah, your grace is enough. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. Oh, God, I sing your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me, for me. For me. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for how great are you, Lord. Your splendor, your your majesty, Lord. We bow in awe of you. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. And sing how great and how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And no, all will see how great and how great is our God. Sing H to H. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, oh, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God is three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. The lion and the lamb, and how great is our God. We 
sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, oh, how great is our God. Sing your the name. You are the name above all oh, names. Worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great is our God. You're the name, you are the name above all names. Oh, God, you're worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. And how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great. Is our God. Lord, we're grateful for you today. We're grateful for the things that you have done in our lives, all the miracles, Lord. We just don't thank you enough. And with this song today, Lord, we express our gratitude. Oh, my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end and you never do. So I throw up my head and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah. So we got one response. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide. Well, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah 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 Oh, hallelujah We lift you up, Lord Oh, come, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Sing, come on. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Sing, come on. Oh, 
come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord sing come on Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise Praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I just pray that you would open our hearts to receive from your word today. That you would speak through Pastor Mike, Lord, to plant seeds that would grow in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Calvary. If you have a Bible and you'd like to turn with me, turn with me to Amos chapter 8. Yes, it's the Old Testament book. In a moment, I'm going to read to you from this chapter a few verses. You know, one of the things that I've learned over the years about the Bible is that there are themes that are more important than others. For example, both the Old Testament and New Testament aggressively talks about the sovereignty of God. It's a theme that cannot be ignored if you read God's word. Another one is the credibility of God's word. You know, both Old and New Testament, but especially the New Testament, just talks about how God's word is flawless and it's without error. And it's always credible for every decision that we make. Another one of those themes, and this has to do with Father's Day, is that both in Old and New Testament passages, we are reminded, in fact, we are told consistently the role of a man in his home, whether he's the husband, whether he is the father, but the Bible holds him accountable as being the spiritual leader in his family. And what I'd like to do on this Father's Day is take a little different direction, come in through a different door, and I want to talk about what happens when God is ignored too long. I'm going to read from the NIV. If my translation is a little different than yours, you'll know why. But I'm reading several verses. I will read it quickly. But here's what the Bible says in Amos chapter 8, verses 4 through 14. He says, Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor in the land, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat, skipping the measure and boosting the price and cheating the dishonest scales? Buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it mourn? The whole land will rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious feasts in the morning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from the sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the lovely young women strong young, and strong young men will faint because of thirst. 
They who swear by the shame of Samaria or say, as surely as your God lives, O Dan, or as surely as the God of Beersheba lives, they will fall never to rise again. Let's pray for a moment. Father, thank you for this special day and for the men who represent you so well. And may all of us in that role, may we always, Father, lean on you for the courage and the wisdom that we need to do a good job. Help our children especially to be patient with us because even after all these years, we're not as good as we want to be. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk about what happens when God is ignored too long. We all ignore him from time to time, but sometimes we get in that state where we just completely disregard the presence of God in our lives. There's a verse here that I want to isolate. It's verse 11. And in my outline, I'd like to read this to you. And here's what it says. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. So what does he mean? Now, in order for us to understand really the direction this is going, we need to, we need to change the word famine to the word hunger. And let me reread this verse and insert that word hunger in there. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a hunger in the land. Not a hunger of food or thirst for water, but a hunger of hearing the words of the Lord. You know, what this is really saying, and I have a little note in my outline, and you may fill in the blank if you're using yours. It says, there will come a time when we will read the Bible and even hear the Bible, and it will mean nothing. One reason this is so strange is because for us as believers, one of the verses that we build so much comfort from is Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. And basically what it says is, the Lord is speaking, he says, my word will never return to me void. We are counting on the fact that when we share God's word, when we speak God's word, even if they act like they're disinterested, even if they totally ignore it, we know the Holy Spirit is taking God's word and doing something with it. But Amos says to his generation, as the Holy Spirit says to us, when we ignore God too long, we will have a hunger for God's word. We may read it. We may hear it. And it will mean nothing to us. So when God is ignored, let me just mention three things that Amos says that we need to be aware of. When God is ignored, we become, number one, indifferent to the word of God. And I want to read verse 12 to you. And here's what it says. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Interesting. They want it, but at the same time, they can't have it. Now, I want to take a little different direction with this because I think this is very interesting. One of the things we learn in the Bible, and this is a little note in my outline, is so often God lets the judgment fit the crime. We just say, God, this is what we want, and everything around us says that's not the direction you should go. Counsels against it. People who love us advise us differently. But we are so determined that this is what we want in spite of that God says, okay, if this is what it takes for you to learn, then you can have it. So let me give you some biblical examples of this. One is in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. We know the story. He said, dad, all I want is my freedom. I don't want any boundaries. I don't want any constraints. I don't want anybody telling me what to do, when to go to bed, when to get up, when to go to work. I don't want any of that. I just want to be free. So you know what the father said? <clears throat> you got it. I'm going to give you a little money, part of the inheritance, and I want you to take it, and I want you to realize it's not all it's cracked up to be. And of course, what we learned from the prodigal son is he was a major disaster because he got what he wanted. Another example in the Bible, and I'm not going to read it, but I will reference it, is Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 32. And in this particular passage, we have this story where Paul says, as people, as we as a generation, progress more and more into disobedience, God says there is a pattern here. And three times in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, 
and God gave them up. And every time it says God gave them up, it was to a worse lifestyle, a greater disobedience, a less interest in spiritual things. Even to the point where God said, where a man would desire a man and a woman would desire a woman. And God said, that is part of what you are seeking, is to say, we want no constraints. We want to be able to do whatever we want, whatever feels good. And he says, as I let that continue in you, it will go to a greater area of concern. Another example is in Numbers chapter 11. In verses 18 to 20, we're reminded that the Israelites, as they were going through the wilderness, you know, they're going, oh, Lord, we've got this manna, and we are so tired of manna, what we would give for a good steak. We would just like to have some meat. And they complain, complain and whine, and finally Moses goes to God and says, Lord, we've got to do something about this. And God says, all right, if it's meat you want, it's meat you're going to get. And so quail came down from however, and the first day it was great, and the first week it was fine, but after the second month and then for the years, they were so tired of it. The Bible says they were eating it so much it even came out of their nose. They were getting what they wanted, and they complained so much about it that God said, all right, if this is what you want, I'm going to give it to you in abundance. You know, let's talk about hell for a minute. You know what hell is? Hell is an absolute desire to have a life without God. And you know what hell is? The absolute fulfillment of that desire. Because someone says, I don't want anybody telling me. I don't want anyone forcing me. I don't want anyone have to deal with. And God says, if that's what you want, then that's what you're going to get. And then here in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the prophet says, and there's going to be a famine in the land. You have rejected God so much that God's going to say, you're not even going to be able to recognize me or my word or my prophet or any of this. And there's going to be a hunger for me, but you're not going to be able to satisfy it. Can you imagine what would happen if all our desires were gone? And that's what happens these Israelites, and to us today, God fulfills this desire to live a life without him by taking away our desire for him. And this isn't just speaking to those without God. This is speaking to those of us in the family of God. The Israelites were the people of God. We are the children of God if we have Jesus Christ in our life. And the Bible says, if you turn against him, rebel, whatever you do, if this is your passion, there will come a time that you're going to get what you want. Now, I want to give you an example of what desire looks like in a more obedient way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, many of us are familiar with this verse, but here's what Paul says. Yet, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul says, I have this desire, I have this passion, and I cannot help but follow through and give in because this is important to me. And yet there will come a time in disobedience where we ignore God too long, and even the word of God will have no effect upon us. The second thing I want to say is there's an, we are indifferent to the warnings of God. And I'd like you to turn with me, if you will, in your Bible to Amos chapter 4. If you're in Amos chapter 8, just turn back left just a little bit. And this is very interesting. In Amos chapter 4, Amos is saying to the Israelites, guys, some bad things are happening if you don't change your direction. So listen to what Amos says. God is speaking. He says, I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord." Interesting how even when God says your disobedience, your lack of obeying and following through in your commitment to me, it's going to get to the point where you can't even recognize the value of God's word. 
but it's also going to get to the point where all these warning signs are in your life and you're not going to be able to recognize those either. In my outline, I have this question, this statement. Name one area where the Holy Spirit is challenging you, but you are ignoring. You know, I, I am aware that we all have blind spots. The areas where everyone else sees it, but we do not. And it might be the wife and the kids, and it might be a neighbor or friend, <laughs> someone at work, whatever. And they might be the ones who will say, I've noticed this attitude. You know, I've noticed this habit. I have seen this developing in your life, and I just want to bring it to your attention. And our response is this. So, how dare you? I don't see it. When the Holy Spirit wants to challenge us, if he can't do it through the word, he does it through other people. As iron sharpens iron, that's how God gets our attention many times. And yet, even when people that know us, even when people that we care about confront us with something going on in our life, our response is, I don't care and I don't agree. You know, in Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 through 15, I'm not going to read it, but I will just remind us of it. Jesus says to his audience, he says, you know, as it was in the Old Testament, it is today. There are people who have ears but cannot hear and they have eyes but they cannot see. And he was talking about whenever I would give a parable, whenever I would have a teaching, there would be some of you who would say, I get it. But there would be a lot of you who would say, means nothing to me. He is speaking in another language. There's a third thing that happens when we ignore God too long. You know, I've talked about when God is ignored, we become indifferent to the word of God. We become indifferent to the warnings of God. But the third thing I want to say from this passage is we become indifferent to the worship of God. It says in verse 5, as I read from my outline, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? You know, basically what he's saying is this. He says, even when you go to church, it doesn't work for you. This whole idea of worship is a waste of time. I mean, you're in the service and all you're thinking about is when can I get on with the day? When you're in church, the things cross your mind about, well, I need to go to the store and I can't wait to get to lunch and I have all these other things that I want to do. And church is just here and I'm here, but it's in the way and it means nothing to me. He says, you go to church on that Sunday as he references the Sabbath and all you can think about is What's going on outside? I have a little statement here, and it says, this emphasis that Amos is making is a statement about our spirituality. Now, I have a verse I want to read from Matthew 4, verse 4. Listen to what Jesus says, and I'll tie this all together. Jesus says, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, we're all aware of how necessary the quiet time reading the Bible and prayer is for those of us who want to be connected to the Father and to grow in our Christian lives. But what we sometimes forget is that as we need food and water to grow grow physically, we need the spiritual part of God in our lives as well. And that's the quiet time. I don't want to get onto that again because I've talked about it before. But Jesus is saying, when you're not connected to God in fellowship, not relationship, because that never changes if you're a believer, but when you're not connected to him in that fellowship part where we're getting along, one of the things that happens is you're in a service, per se, and things are happening. The music, the preaching, there might be a testimony, there might be a, 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 a someone's life is being challenged and changed, and the effect it has on others is not the same effect it has on you, because all you can say is, I'm here, but I'm not. I'm participating, but I'm not getting. This is meaning nothing to me. And Jesus said, We've gotten back to the point where we think it's all about the bread and it's not about the relationship and fellowship we have with God. 
So let me wind this down. So what do we do to help somehow resolve this state that we're in? And I have here in the outline this statement. To eliminate the famine, to eliminate that hunger that we cannot get satisfied, we need CPR. So let me take those letters, CPR, and mention three things. Number one, we must confess our sins to God. You know, regardless of how far away we are from God, how, how, how distant we feel, disconnected, there is always going to be an awareness that says, I know I'm different and I need to do something about it. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Of all the things we can do to make a change, nothing, nothing replaces, surpasses to begin with God. To basically say, I know. I realize, I admit it, I know. But the second thing of the CPR is not only that we must confess our sins to God, but the letter P, we must profess our desire to change. Interesting. Look at what James says in chapter 5, verse 16. I read this to it, and it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed, so that you might have a chance to change. Now, this is not an absolute statement I'm about to make, but it's a big statement, and that is this. If we really want to have the opportunity to change, not only do we have to begin with God and that relationship, but we've got to bring other people into the equation. We've got to admit to our wife, honey, I haven't been walking with God lately. To our kids, I apologize for not being the spiritual leader in our home. To the people that we have sunk just a little lower, whether our language has changed, whether our attitudes, whether the jokes we laugh about, these kind of things, where we are not being the kind of person and, as we say in spiritual terms, the kind of witness that we want to be. We've got to be able to say to someone, you know what? I'm needing to change. And I'm sorry for the person that I've been. But here's the last one, and this is very interesting. We're talking about the CPR we need to understand how to deal with this famine that's going on in our lives with God. We must confess our sins to God. We must profess our desires to change in the letter R. Are you ready for this? We need accountability for when we, are, when, for when we relapse. Now, I really want to be honest and genuine in this because relapsing is part of who we are. The Bible in the Old Testament talks about backsliding. We are always taking three steps forward and sliding back one or two. It is harder to maintain ground than it is to gain ground. So we're going to go backwards from time to time in whatever commitment, whatever direction we make. But I want you to see what the Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 23. And I read this to us again from the New International Version. The Bible says, he who rebukes a man will in the end gain more favor than he who has a flattering tongue. Interesting. We need people to hold us accountable. It's one thing to say, Father, I need your help. It's another thing to confess to someone else to say, I've blown it. But we need people who are, going to go, who are going to surround us, who've got our back, who's going to be able to say, when you fail, when you lose ground, I'm going to be there for you. And we need someone who cares about us enough to confront us with that, to be able to say, I know what you said, I know where you want to be, and I have seen you make a step backwards. We call it a relapse. Now, here's something interesting, and I sum up everything I've said with this, and this might be the most important thing I'm going to say this morning. And here it is. God judges us more. You ready for this? On the information we receive than what we believe. And we think... Just because I've heard it, I've read it, I've been exposed to it, I bought into it at one time, if I am not complying, if I'm not obeying, it's no big deal. This is what we have heard, and this is what we do. This is how we behave. 
And God says, the accountability that I have for you, fathers, husbands, men, I expect you to be the spiritual leader in your home. What I hold you accountable is not just what you believe, but what you have heard, what you have received all these years. I am as guilty as anyone of ignoring the Lord. I hate it. I know better. I don't want to be that way. And I would say, like Paul, that in many ways, I am the chief of sinners. And I'm not just saying that to be humble. I'm saying it because when I realize all that God has exposed me to and how much of it I have taken in and applied to my life, I am immensely guilty. But it doesn't mean that we're giving up. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for never, ever really giving up on us. But Father, at the same time, Help us to recognize how much we have been presented, how much we've been given, and just how little of it we have appreciated. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we always pray. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away All oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Yeah When I was your foe, still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me. But I felt no worth. You paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all oh, the overwhelming, never ending love of God Oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 Why oh, couldn't earn it? I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Yeah Love of God, yeah. See, there's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light. Mountain you won't climb. Coming after me. 
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Let's declare this, sing there's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't you're coming after me, and oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. Oh, I couldn't earn, I don't deserve, still you give yourself away. love of God, yeah. Oh, the reckless love of God that chases me down. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Thank you, Lord, for your reckless love today, that you would leave the 99 to go after us. When we were lost, that you found us. Lord, I bless the fathers today. I bless us as we go forth this week to be your light, to be your hands, to be your feet. Jesus, that we would make a difference in this world for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, Calvary fam. Look forward to seeing you in person next week at the park after service. Take care.